So this is the Unmasked Podcast episode four. Four, yeah. Yeah, it's been a bumpy one. It's yeah. been a bumpy one. And got a lot of traction from the last one. It was it was a uh, they really expected it, but today. Ah, well, uh, true. He ain't gonna be happy to the, the last guy wouldn't be happy to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he actually is. The, yeah, he's yeah, yeah, he's bigger. He's he's one who's more underground. Yeah. He he's in everything. Yeah, he's a people's person. I don't even know. Should should I even introduce him? Uh, I think he could he could introduce himself. So good afternoon. Okay, good. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, Crash and Jagger, um, and thank you for inviting me to your show. I, I must say, I listened to one episode of it, and I was immediately impressed. Yeah. And I can tell you, I'm a very critical person, pro to say so, and I am not easily impressed. But I was really impressed with the way you guys conducted the, the, well, the episode I listened to. Yeah. Um, what really struck me is that you guys are not afraid to ask what I think would be the obvious questions. When you're interviewing somebody, there's some obvious questions you should ask. Sometimes uncomfortable, but it's always the responsibility of uh, the interviewer to ask the questions, and the interviewer should decide how they're going to respond. Um, by the way, my name is Kenton Chance. Mm-hmm. Um, most people associate me with Eyewitness News. <laughs> He's yes. associated yes. with yes. Eyewitness <laughs> News. <laughs> how would you describe yourself in relation to Eyewitness News? Um, well, uh, as a journalist, I believe in pursuing the story wherever it goes. And you know, um, I I'm just a simple person, really. Um, I am fair to everybody. I report as factually as I can. Mm. I think some people are afraid of me. I don't know why. If I come to you to get a comment from you, it's because I want your 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 comment. You decide what comment you're gonna give, and it's only the comment you give I'm gonna use. Do you think you you've been unfairly painted in a, a wrong light sometimes? I don't think so. You know, I think you know there are some people who would say. Um, Kenton Chance is a, a complete asshole. I don't know. If, can I use that word? Yeah, yeah no problem. Uh, some people say Kenton Chance is a complete asshole. And some people tell you that Kenton is the best person there is. And the truth is, I could be a complete asshole. Yeah. And for some people, I, I, I might have been a, a, a complete, you know, <laughs> that word. <laughs> and for others, I could be the best person ever. The, the, the point I'm making is that different people experience people differently. So. Yeah. I mean, there might be some merit in everything that everybody says about me, but I, I'm not all things for all people. I'm not the same same person for everybody, I guess. So you're, you're the truth. Well, I try uh, to be true to least myself. Your truth, yeah. Yeah, I try to be true to myself, you know. And, you okay. Know. Um, so, so we should expect nothing but the truth from Kent and Chance. Yeah, hey, well, go forth. If I well, ask you anything, nothing but the well, truth. Well, if you if you ask me something, I would give you. The, be- the, the best <laughs> answer I can or the most appropriate yeah, answer so you I won't twist I it I don't have to twist anything uh, I just <laughs> respond okay it's funny because coming into it you know you tell like a couple of people oh we're going to be doing we're going to be interviewing Kenton Chance this week and they're like boy Kenton Kenton is a straightforward guy and you're going to you just say whatever well, come to your head first huh? <laughs> and I was like yeah that's the kind of person we want on the Unmasked podcast but yeah. to start things I suppose lightly but it's going to be kind of double. It has some underlying layers to it. You studied in Taiwan. Yes, I did. And how would you describe that experience? Well, my experience in, in Taiwan was a wonderful experience. It was a, a transformational experience. I spent six wonderful years there. At the time, it was one-sixth of my life when I left. I went there when I was 30, and I left when I was 36. Initially, I was supposed to spend five years. I stayed an extra year and completed my master's. I got a, a scholarship from the government of Taiwan uh, as a consequence of the relationship we have. And it was, re- it was a really, really great experience. You know, okay. it's a wonderful experience. Mm-hmm. Your bio on Facebook says multilingual. Well, I do speak some Chinese. At one time, I spoke some Spanish. I think I, I speak enough Spanish to survive. Okay. But I, um, I, I do speak some, some Chinese also. And I speak dialect, which I think is a language separate from English. All right. You like them thing there. <laughs> All right. So um, um, you said earlier that you are fair yes. in your reporting. Yes, I, I try to be fair in my You try reporting. to be fair. However, a good bit of the population has also labeled you as a bit of 
a bit biased to the opposition. Do you think that's accurate? I, I don't think it's accurate. I mean, I, you see, the thing is, right, I think in journalism, people have a skewed notion. In, in St. Vincent and Gwen, sorry, people have a skewed notion of what journalism is. You know, journalism is, you know, investigating, gathering, presenting the, the truth or the, the facts. And a story is never complete. When you publish a story, you, you publish essentially your latest draft. Mm. For all of the years that I've been a journalist, it has been under the UAP administration. And as a journalist, I believe very strongly in holding to account the holders of power. And it just so happens that the ULP is is in power. The, is in power. Yeah. <laughs> so don't you think it would be ridiculous? They're the ones who control the public purse. They control the spending. They have um, access to the state machinery, in, including the propaganda arm, the coercive arm of the state. They, they control of that. Isn't it a, a little bit ridiculous for me to focus all of my attention on the opposition, those who are outside? And, and that is not to say that I should not hold the, account, the oppos opposition to account, yeah. which I also also do. But, you know, people often expect you, you know, like a, a little man on the street, they expect you to focus more on him than the, the big cooperation that's probably mm -hmm. pumping um, waste in the river going down into the sea and affecting people. Right? Yeah. It's, it's a ridiculous notion. I mean... Okay. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned about the media um, and covering news and what's not. What is your view on how news is being broadcast to the public here? in St. Vincent on a whole, by newspaper, television, and radio. Well, you see, when I came here, right, I, at the beginning of the show, I told you guys that I was really impressed by your podcast because in the interview that I heard you guys did, that's what journalism should be about, to ask a guy the tough questions, the questions that he's avoiding answering. Those are what people want to get the answers to. <laughs> Um, I don't want to speak too critically of the media. I could tell you up front, mm. I don't watch television news. I generally don't watch a lot of TV, partly because I don't have time and partly because of the way I grew up. I grew up very poor, and for a long time in my life, we didn't have a TV in our house. So I did never had really this love for television. I love to read a lot, and I spend most of my time online. I, I, I mean, I don't want to put down anybody's media outlet, but I... I, I can't tell it was the last time I watched local television news. Okay, then. I listen to radio news every so often, and I find myself criticizing it more than listening to it because, you know, there's some <laughs> fundamental well, things in it. Probably that's because you're a journalist, yeah, and you probably I mean, expect it to be a, a, a particular way. Yeah, well, there are some fundamental things. Radio news has a format, you know. Yeah. Um, people talk about journalism, and every journalist has their style, but journalism has a form. Journalism is not literature. It is not diplomacy. It, it is journalism. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of the people in, in media are not trained, including at the editorial level. So they are doing, uh, I think, their best in the circumstances sometimes. But sometimes they're just totally wrong. They're well-intentioned, but yeah. just wrong in their intentions. <laughs> well, you said you weren't. <laughs> you said you were impressed by us, and you think that's the way. So you're not impressed by the other outlets <laughs> because you don't <laughs> listen to them. <laughs> Well, you know, part of it is access to it eh, because, I mean, I have a television in my house, but it's, it's internet-based. Uh. So anything that is not available on the internet, I'm highly unlikely to okay, watch okay. it. I mean, there are things online on Facebook, you know, also mm -hmm. that, you know, I could watch. But, you know, sometimes these things are habit also. So if you don't have that habit of watching it, then... You spoke of the radio news, and I'm sure you've heard from time to time at least one or two of your stories per week oh, being just time. just That's reiterated every day, every day. I, I, <laughs> when i drive in i just keep cussing like yesterday <laughs> i went to pick up my wife and we're driving home i said i cussed i said that's my story you know yeah you know i mean but what are you gonna do what are you gonna do exactly i mean some people you know well you know there are people who believe like i was in tokyo the other day right yeah and a guy say i witness give me something now I say, I ain't had nothing. You say, what do you mean you not? All them flicks they just stuck to the phone. <laughs> I say, when you take out your phone and, oh, I could talk that. Like yeah, you can, you can, you can. So, so when you take out your phone and you take a picture, you doesn't make money? <laughs> they say, well, but you're making plenty. And, you know, there are people who believe that, you know, every time a story is published on Eyewitness News, I make money or whatever. You know, it's probably that I'm a poor businessman because 
I I think the, the business side of Eyewitness News is suffering and has suffered a lot. I can be I should be making a lot more money from Eyewitness News that I'm making. I'm not one to complain, um, but I love journalism. Yeah. And I mean, if I were to go to meet with a client to get an ad and a story breaks, I would probably call him and cancel the, you know, the meeting to get the ad and go and pursue the story. So why is it you haven't partnered with any other? entity like um, well i have somebody who i have partnered with and he's been here from the inception his name is ovid book mm -hmm. um but ovid book is a developer mm -hmm. and i think he's one of the best developers in simmons and grandes um and i'm not saying that lightly he is a very reliable person he's a person who keeps eyewitness news going sometimes i think i'm a little bit um you know when something is going wrong and I feel it should be resolved immediately because that my, my thing is I just want the site to work. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> the site doesn't work. And one of the problem one of the reasons why the site doesn't work is that a lot of you know, the site is growing so fast that we have to keep pumping resources into it and something we have to upgrade and the upgrade might take seventy two hours when I think it should take seventy two minutes or what have you. <laughs> but Ovid did come on board very early since I was in Taiwan. Mm. Uh, at the time I, I approached him i said look over there i have this project i'm working on i don't have any money you know he came highly recommended by a very good friend of mine i had known Ovid all of my life and for the record i would say that Ovid is also Ovid is a political activist also yeah. but i can tell you Ovid is an absolute professional Ovid has total access to eyewitness news and he would never go and publish anything unless i ask him specifically to do it but when it comes to ma making sure that the the website works he makes it work um, I have had approaches before um, people have you know come with various pitches and whatever some of them I thought was total bullshit and I told them up front you know I think this is bullshit some of them you know could have make a lot of money but I would have been prostituting eyewitness news and I, I just <laughs> said well you know mm -hmm. you know so I, I, and, and sometimes you know you have a philosophy of you have this thing and you have this vision behind it and then you don't want to prostitute or pervert or water it down. You know, that's the case. That's why Eyewitness News is as it is. And I would tell you, I'd rather shut Eyewitness News down mm. than to water it down. Mm. I would prefer to shut it down rather than sell it to somebody or than to prostitute it. You know, the last election, somebody met me in Kingstown. And they said, Kenton, you have built up all of this capital. What are you going to do with it? Why don't you just throw it behind one of the political parties? They say, just choose whichever you want yeah. and make mm -hmm. some money. I said, no. I didn't start Eyewitness News. Well. In fact, Eyewitness News was started as a school project. Okay. You know, oh. it's just something I had to do for a program. And at my university, I did my program in English. But there were some students who didn't study Mandarin. And I, I went to a university that had an international college where all of the programs were in English. But the administration, a lot of the administrators weren't the most fluent in English. And uh, when I started my university program, I spoke Mandarin at a certain level where I was able to help some people. So I said, you know, we have all of these issues in the school because of the language barrier. Why don't I use this platform to start a, you know, help to, to bridge that gap. And if you go back to some of the earlier stories, it was about my university. Yeah. And then I branched out until it became, you know, national highly focused on civilians and grandees. Oh, true. Um, another question I have for you is, um, what is your strong point? Um, I know you're a journalist, so you would cover sports, entertainment, politics. What is your strong point as I a journalist? I think politics. <laughs> politics. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like to cover politics. I mean, it's not something that gets you a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. If you cover it in the way that I do. But it's something that, you know, I, I like to do. Like I said, I believe strongly in holding people to account. And mm -hmm. that is a, a function of the media. And Sh -sh should, I so? mm -hmm. should I use the word provoke? <laughs> um, oh. As in your, your style. Is it to provoke in a sense to... To get at the politicians? No, I can't get a politician. Politicians are such powerful <laughs> people. Look at me. How I can get a politician? No, oh, I don't promote uh, them. No, well, okay, okay. Have, have you ever, I don't want to say received a threat, but been aggressively approached by a politician or someone within that realm? Well, As for like a story you've, you've done or the way that you are. Uh, I have had heated exchange. Like once I had a really heated exchange on the fo phone with a certain politician a very powerful politician mm. and then my after i got off the phone my wife asked me who was that 
And when I, I told her who the person was, who the politician was, she said that her mouth just dropped. <laughs> but, you know, I, I mean, my thing is, you know, I don't have anything personal against politicians. Once you come with me, come to me in a respectful way, yeah, I, I would respect you. Everybody good. You, if you speak to me strongly, I don't really swear anything. I, yeah. But if you speak to me strongly, I would speak to you strongly too. Okay. And then when that conversation is done, that's that. I have no heart. Me, me and a man carry on people in my heart. and My heart is too small for that. I don't do them thinking. Uh, so, so you wouldn't water down eyewitness in any way or form whatsoever? No. No matter how much money? No. When I book, a, when somebody book an ad with me, if I think there's a need to tell them, I tell them, I say, look, on eyewitness news, advertising dollars by advertising space. Yeah. The commitment we're giving to you is that your ad would be there for the period when it should be there it does not buy goodwill it does not buy um marketing um free marketing in our editorial or editorial section or anything like that yeah it just, it just buys your advertising space because for journalism to be strong it has to be independent journalism needs money to survive mm. but it's not because you are my biggest advertiser and then you are screwing your customers over it doesn't mean that i will ignore a story about you i would be fair to you and ask you Look, this is the situation. This is what your, one of your customers uh, have said. What is your response? But yeah. I'm not going to totally ignore the story. Do you think that um, a debate between politicians, the two political, main political parties here, is viable? It can happen. Yeah. But I would tell you, I mean, most people know me as a journalist, but I also study politics. I studied international affairs. I have a master's degree in international affairs. If you are invited to a debate, if I, if I can't in chance, I'm invited to a debate, any debate, the first thing I will ask, who is my opponent? Mm. And the second question I will ask, how am I likely to benefit? And in answering the question, how am I likely to benefit? I have to ask myself, how is my opponent likely to benefit? The very fact that I decide to debate someone, it says something about my view of the person. The very fact that I agree to give you this interview, it says something about your show. Okay. Mm -hmm. If I had said, you say, you guys, I mean, people invite me to all kinds of things. I say, look, no, no, this is not, some, this is not something I'm interested <laughs> in. You know, this is not for me. Yeah. But, you yeah. know, somebody sent me the link and they said, listen to this. And then, interestingly, afterwards, you guys, you guys, and, and I told you up front when you contacted me, uh, yeah. I think it was you, um, yeah. Crash, you con con how I felt about the show. And yes, that's my honest opinion. And like I told you, some people say I'm a very critical person. I don't think anybody has been worse off for thinking critically. I really don't think so. And you know, mm. it's something I'm happy to say I'm a critical thinker. Mm. If you were to be approached by either of the parties, let's say ULP was to come and say, Kenton, I want you to run for this constituency. Where you're from? Would uh, would you would, you would you would you? Well, I mean, you you s yeah. Would you would <laughs> you would you would you consider it? Um, would it be based? Would your decision be based on the party itself? Uh, well, the thing is, I have not given any serious consideration to electoral politics. I mean, people have met me in the street and say, you know, why don't you get into politics? But the question I ask them, why should I get into politics? Mm -hmm. You know maybe maybe i don't know maybe i'm a household name maybe it's, i'm a no name that people know a lot mm -hmm. but does that mean that i would necessarily make a good politician what is my political philosophy the um, reason why i ask that is because you're you you you're a journalist you go out you see the issues you mm -hmm. you hear the cry of the people but does that mean that i can resolve no. them well that is true that well i was hoping you would you would tell me that so you don't think you're capable of being well, that force sure you have some ideas yeah, I do have ideas, but you know, if you're a politician, you do not exist in isolation. You, you I, in order to survive in some and events and to effect change, you have to be part of the two main political parties. Or mm -hmm. you, you, you generally, you have to be. You can do more if you're in government. I mean, some of the things that politicians have to do. I mean, politics is a nasty game. Once, I was um, at the prime minister's office. And some of the politicians were filing. Some of the cabinet members were filing in. And I said to one of my colleagues, I said, these gentlemen are coming into this room to dis decide whose breadfruit tree to cut down. <laughs> and is, is, this, is, is this true? Yeah. It's the truth. I mean, sometimes that's what cabinet does. They decide who 
they think should survive and who they think no you know what this one is too big let me cut this one down to size and you know i have had certain experiences some of which is not in my interest to make make public and i ask myself you know i mean christ i'm, I'm a citizen of this country um is somebody uh, wanting me to come and beg for something that i i think i'm entitled to and i yeah. say man shit that i could i could live without that i can you know you know, I, I'm trying not to say too much because there's some things that are better left on side for, you know, various reasons. Okay. <laughs> All right. So politics is a nasty game and you have been time and time again um, willing to, to poke the barrier a bit. You know, the, the, the balloon that is messy politics in St. Vincent and Grenadines. You're not afraid of having the pin next to it. In case it in case it explodes, now the why well, I lost the train of thought. Now the <laughs> no, is it when they say the breadfruit tree thing? Eh, I'd be thinking, why? Well, I wonder what kind of breadfruit tree they cut down that day. No, but I tell you the truth, you know. I told one of my colleagues, uh, you know, I saw, you know, some of the most. Mm. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, they got there. I saw some of the most popular politicians, you know, the powerful ones and the yeah. big boys. And I say, boy, in this room, they decide whose breath we treat to cut down <laughs> cabinet. <laughs> I mean, they decide a lot of good things, I mean, but that's what government should be about, doing good yeah. things to empower citizens. But in that cabinet room, they also make a lot of decisions about, boy, this one is too big for your shoes. This one is becoming a threat. Let's cut him down. The ULP gov um, administration has been labeled very often as you know they don't they don't mess around you know they 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 have their plan and their plan is their plan and they're gonna execute it to how they feel it should be executed the ndp has been often seen as soft what are, what are your thoughts on on that you think they're soft i think the ndp is suffering from a serious communications problem mm. um they seem to have a, a problem with uh, selling their messages to the public and making the message stick, uh, yeah. having a message take root. I think that's one of the biggest problems. Maybe that's mm, I see it that way because I am a communications professional and my bias is all about. Because I believe, regardless of whatever profession you're in, if you can't communicate, it makes no sense. You know, mm. you could have the greatest discovery in physics, but if you can't communicate it in a way that makes sense, then you know, well, so what? Nobody would really. Um, and the the NDP also suffered for a long time from poor leadership um, under Mr. Eustace. I think Mr. Eustace is an uh, honorable gentleman, <clears throat> but as a politician, not such a good politician. So what would, you, what would you say the case of Friday, who is... Is it very similar? Well, that, that is your opinion. I, I, think, I, 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 I think Friday <laughs> is a substantial improvement over Mr. Eustace. Uh, um, if you say he's very similar, it depends on what your expectations of a politician um, is. Yeah. I mean, Gonzalez has his strengths, and the same things that endear him to people are the same things that would cause some people to skin up their nose at him. Mm -hmm. You know, I think... You know, the, the thing is, Gonzalez is very good at communicating. Yeah. And right. once you can communicate, you really have the edge. You know, Gonzalez has that, you know, he can connect with the most simple of people, the most uneducated, and he can connect with the most educated, the most sophisticated. You know, he knows how to use local parlance and to use it well. You know, he, he, he is a very folksy person also you know i was I, I have been analyzing to a certain extent friday's communications and there was a speech he gave some time ago and i don't know if i should say it now because it's something yes, it. i want to analyze oh, okay. and one of the things that i notice he does is that when he uses a certain word at least in that speech that he probably thinks that you know some people might not understand he follows on and use a simpler word yeah and it's a really good communication tool to have. So you can have one speech and you can reach a broad spectrum of, of the population. Um, I would tell you, I need to clear my phone. 
I will tell you that when the NDP was doing their leadership transition, yeah. I thought that Sinclair Lika would have been a better option. <laughs> I thought so. Uh, well, what are your thoughts on it now? <laughs> <laughs> Soon after the, the leadership transition, uh, Sinclair Lika conducted himself in a way that caused me to think it must have been that the people who interact with him <laughs> most no. knew something that we did not know why they chose Friday. Uh, but the thing is, I think Sinclair, I think Mr. Leacock is a very astute politician. The thing is, he is the politician in the NDP that I think does the most political education of the populace. And in order to do political education, you have to have a political philosophy. And that's what Gonzalez does. He tries to educate people about, you know, his political philosophy, his vision for the country, what informs mm -hmm. what he does. And Leacock, more than any politician in the NDP, does that. But the thing is, soon after the, the, um, the election transition, and it might, it, you know, he, maybe his ego was bruised or whatever, and I don't think he conducts himself that way anymore. Um, he really conducted himself in a way that said, you know, I thought you would have been a better leader for the NDP, but now I'm not so sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it seems now that he and Friday, they have reconnected and it, seem to, it seems as if they're going to be, um, they have a really good relationship. I think Friday gives him a chance to represent the party and, and what have you. So it would, it, it's, um, it's an interesting dynamic that I think it, it's, um, the, the, the country is only better off um, for it. And, you know, there was also uh, something that happened sh soon after Friday became leader, <coughs> where Friday was on a radio station and Gonzales called in. Mm. And to be honest with you, I thought the arguments were on Gonzales' side. But the presentation, he totally lost it. The Prime Minister totally lost it. And the Prime Minister came across very Trumpian. Mm. And Friday came across very Prime Ministerial. And that was very uh, early in, in the, um, after the transition. And, and like I said, listening logically, yeah. I think the arguments were on the prime minister's side. But in terms of presentation, the prime minister lost almost all, his, all points for that. You know, I'm not too sure if you would agree with me on this. I think, well, I grew up with Ralph Gonsalve being the prime minister until now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, he still is. He still is. He still is. He still is. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> um, yeah. So, my view of a politician, you know, he's, he's an outgoing guy. He would come. He would come up here now, see us here. Guys, what you're drinking? You know, you don't really get that appeal from Friday. Mm -hmm. um, would, you, would you say that plays a, a, a factor as how he's presented to the public? Well, it does play a role. I mean, your ability to connect with people, it, it does play a role. But, but the thing is, right, um, like, for instance, I don't believe in telling or suggesting in any way who people should vote for. Yeah. Because as, as a man, I'm 39 years old, married, no kids, university education, I have a vehicle, I have a house. The things that I would want that would influence how I vote is not the same things that would influence the either of you too. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I made that point to say there's some people who wouldn't care if the Prime Minister meets them in the street and, and talks to them. Like, for instance, a businessman. He doesn't give a hell if the Prime Minister meets him in the street and talks to him. But what he concerned about is, like, how is how are your taxes? Yeah. yeah, yeah. The taxes affecting me. You know, I say, look, you know, because of your policy on VAT or what have you, this is what is happening. And I have a, I have a supermarket here. Mm. I have to pay your kind of taxes. But people open up a, su a supermarket outside my, my, my supermarket every day. They don't pay anything except pay $5 or $2 to, to town board. Exactly. So, you know, they're, they're, diff they're different things. People look at politics different differently. I like how you're bringing that. You covered a story. I like how you brought in that with the, the, vendors. the vendors. You did a story with the vendors out at Massey. What is your whole view on that situation? I went there. And I don't know why the, the um, vendors are being asked to move. That is not a suggestion that there isn't a legitimate reason. I'm just saying I don't know why they're being asked to move. But look, we would be liars if we don't admit 
that economically things are bad in St. Vincent. Things are really rough. Look around Kingston. I was walking down the, that street from Wilson Hill, from um, Lower Kingston Park, down to Grand Bazaar yeah. on Monday. A guy set up a, a fruit stall right next to where, right, uh, ne- right next to Caribbean Reference Lab. Mm. And I knew that the authorities would move in. But I also understood why he set it up there. Tuesday, they move him. Wednesday, a different guy set up one right there. <laughs> Everybody fighting. Everybody Bazaar. wants. Look, this is mango season. Yeah. And drive. I live in Rillen Hill. Drive from Kingston to Rillen Hill. 10, 12, 15 minutes drive. And how many food vendors are you going to pass? People are just trying to make a living. Do you think the ULP government hold power so close to the top to give the impression that, you know, they do things, they're doing things for you? They're doing it for you. Like, you know, it's almost like a favor rather than. As you said earlier, you're entitled to it. I think, yes. You know, in Southeast Asia, if you study the development of a lot of those countries, like yeah. we know Taiwan as a democracy now. <clears throat> and I mean, I lived there. They were very kind to me, educated me for, well, not free, their taxpayer, at the expense of their taxpayers. And people, <clears throat> we hold up Taiwan as a model of what a country can be. And it is, in many ways, a very good model of what a country can be. Taiwan is one of the best countries in the world in which one can live. But how long has Taiwan been a democracy? And would Taiwan have had the level of um, development that it has now if it were a democracy all of the time? There's something that they call Asian democracy, where the state is like a parent. The state is like a big brother. The state, you know, like in China, that's what you have. The people in China generally believes, look, it's all well and fine. What sense does it make if we have freedom of the press and we are poor? You know, so the ULP administration if you study Prime Minister Gonzales and his political philosophy over time, Prime Minister Gonzales is a leftist and maybe an unrepentant leftist. And that is not to suggest... Ex- explain, explain that for me. <laughs> that is not to suggest... Well, once I happened to be in a place and the Prime Minister met one of his comrades from way back and he, he joked at him and he called him by his name. He said, you unrepentant leftist. Uh. I think the Prime Minister has realized that in order to make himself attractive to people, he had to modify some of his um, thinking. Because I, I think at one point he was a real, you know, communist. But now he's a socialist or a social democrat. And, you know, that is a philosophy that I subscribe to to a certain extent. But my view is this. <clears throat> I believe in merit, meritocracy, and all of that. But I believe that there are certain classes and categories of people who are so disadvantaged that if left only to the system, they would ne- their circumstances would never improve. And therefore, they need a hand up. But you give them that hand up to empower them. And I, I'm one of those persons. I receive the hand up. And I use that hand up to empower myself. In the scholarship? Yes. Yeah. And my hand up was also education, not just a scholarship, because I was able to educate myself thanks to the, the support of my parents and my own efforts up to a certain um, level. And then, and then I, I got a scholarship. So, I mean, yeah, the Prime Minister and his party, well, the Prime Minister definitely. I, to be honest with you, a lot of people in the Prime Minister's party, I don't even think they, they understand or subscribe to his philosophy. A lot of them, oh, the ULP is in power. It's a powerful organization. If I run on their <laughs> ticket, I would win. And I go in there, I spend two terms, I get a, a pension, and I get gratuity. <laughs> but it's true, and I set for life. Yeah. <laughs> in, in the UK and even in and the US as well, you would see that there are philosophical differences between the major parties. Are there philosophical differences between the parties, not just here, but in the Caribbean? I say in St. Vincent, there's one philo- philosophical difference. Uh, the ULP believe in small business uh, and big government, 
and the NDP believe in big big business, small government. I think that's a <laughs> philosophical difference, but fundamentally all of them are the same. All of the same. Yeah, same <laughs> cat <catapus. laughs> My goodness. Um, okay, moving over to something a little lighter, but still related to your experience in journalism. Sports since St. Vincent and the Grenadines, has it improved since you started Eyewitness? Do you see any improvement in any of the associations that run sports in well, St. Vincent? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to comment on them because the truth is I don't... We don't cover a lot of sports. We used to, but the sports, the sports reporter we had, mm. um, Glenford Prescott, God bless his soul, he died yeah. a few years ago. And we haven't really had you know, anybody else um, come on. But from what I see, I think the Swimming Association stands out. I think also the Cricket Association. Yeah. I think those two, from my limited observation, seem to be doing a pretty decent job. Okay. Um, as it relates to, well, I guess we're going to skip back over to politics. I don't know, politics <laughs> sweet, so. Um, I know it's the season, you know. Yeah, you know. Um, they, 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 if you were to run or make an assessment of what you see on the streets, in the latest polls. Where are these polls? <laughs> in the latest polls, polls you yeah. see no, no, no poll, I mean. Uh, well, how would you, uh, in your assessment, how would you say it's looking right now? To be honest, I would not want to be in government now. Yeah. Because the circumstances are just dire. I mean, and a lot of it might not necessarily be as a result of the workings of the government but just international circumstances people can also argue well you know these international realities are worsened by local decisions but look um for how much longer can the government afford to give certain categories of people certain groups or classes of people two hundred dollars a month and when we think of two hundred dollars it's not a lot of money it's really not a lot of money i mean i forgot my wallet at home yesterday i borrowed well i thought i left it in the car but then when i went back home i realized well, i borrowed twenty dollars from from my mom and then there was twenty dollars that was in a certain place i wouldn't say where it was there for security reason mm. and then by the time i got home i realized i had spent all 40 <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm asking, what did I do? Like, I bought lunch. I bought a loaf of bread. And I really can't remember. Where the $40 dollars what, what do I do it? Yeah. And just imagine, right? That's $40 in one day. Yeah. You know, and, and like I say, I live in a, in a dink um, household. Double income, no kids. Yeah. And you go through $40 in a day. What about those households where you have children and, I mean... Okay, something I want to ask you. Um, I'm not too sure if you covered the Prime that we have. What is your view on the Prime, the Prime program? I, I thought about applying. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not going to say anything about it? <laughs> I mean... Uh, <coughs> what, well, you know, the, the NDP is saying that they do not agree with it. They prefer loans. I have... My, did, did I actually, they say that I'm not, did they say that? Well, they said they, they prefer loans, like you give people loans that they could pay back. But they, mm. they, had, a, they had a plan to do that. Yeah. And they would have done something in that. Yeah, instead of, the grants. Pri instead of grants. Look, I what had, is your view on that? I had the opportunity to visit Israel before, and I think Tel Aviv is the startup capital of the world, I think, because there is just this culture where people are, there's no shame in feeling. But we also know that there is a high failure rate for startups. The majority of startups don't survive their, their first year. And they say if a startup survives past seven years, then you could probably say it's a, you know, a pretty solid thing. Um, my thing, thing is, is that I believe in giving people opportunities, young people especially. I believe in giving them opportunities. But we can't i don't believe in creating a de dependency culture but I, I also spoke about you know a leg up a hand up giving people a hand mm -hmm. up my view of the prime program i think generally it is a good program mm -hmm. okay i think it's a good program once people have solid business plans and once the business idea is viable because 
we've had like two, three hundred businesses closing because of COVID. If we're going to start a certain number of businesses, we have to ask ourselves, what is the likelihood of my particular business surviving if I start it at this particular time? Because sometimes our idea is not bad, you know, but sometimes it's just that it's at the wrong time. Another issue I have with the Prime program, I do not agree at all with this thing about you're not disclosing who gets the money. This is public money. This is not social welfare, you know. This is not to say that somebody is poor and disadvantaged and therefore to try to avoid further dehumanizing them. We do not publish any. This is where people are applying for public funds to open businesses to create profit. Yeah. So how can you tell me that because somebody criticized somebody that they, you don't you're not gonna de- disclose the names anymore? I don't I don't believe that government money should be spent in the dark. There's been a few names on the list. I show you. Have, well, you've you've published the, the list on eyewitness. No, I've never published it. Okay, why? Well, I don't see I don't see the the import journalistically in in publishing the list. Okay, in, okay. in, in you see. I mean, because the thing is, right? But you've seen the list. I've seen, I've seen list. Some yeah. of the names there, you you have no problem with some of the names being there. I have no issue with any of the names okay. because I don't know what business what? plans. Okay. Are. Look, I always tell people, right? Camilo Gonzalez is the son of Prime Minister Gonzalez. Camilo Gonzalez should not get special treatment because he's the son of Ralph Gonzalez. Neither should Camilo Gonzalez be punished because he's the son of Ralph Gonzalez. Mm. So if your father is the manager or the chairman of national lotteries <laughs> and you have a business idea uh, oh, i just yeah, gave an example yeah, I know, I know, just an example <laughs> just, a just a random thing <laughs> yeah does that mean that you should not get prime money i don't think so Georgia. if your father happens to be the consul general of civil and the grenadines to in toronto yeah. does that mean that you should not get mo- you should not get money because your father is a consul general and you should not al- you should also not be denied money simply because your father is a consul true, general true 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 but you know <laughs> but the thing is there must be transparency yeah people might look i can't say i want the government to help me and i don't want nobody to know that the government helped me that I, be, to use state money for me to make money and enrich myself because mm-hmm. that's where it becomes dangerous of course yeah because yes. when we stop publishing, how do we know? Who got? Who got? Where did the money go? Where did the money go? <laughs> yeah. I don't. Yeah. I, and you know, I, I thought about, you know, a while of making a post about it on my personal Facebook page to make essentially these points. How can you justify spending government money in the dark because somebody comments on who, get, who got the money? I don't believe that you should launch quote-unquote vitriolic attacks on people simply because they have money they, they are spending um, people taxpayer have a right to say oh you got the money i don't think you should get it yeah. mm. and i mean if you're if you applying for the money you have to realize that people there are people who are gonna say i don't think you should get it just like you can't please everybody you know i'm sure in journalism you might say boy this story here story here fantastic <laughs> then you see five comments underneath boy i can't tell you this and that and you're done this and <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the backlash from, from right. Does the backlash of the public oh, matter to you? Yeah. No, it's entertainment. You see, <laughs> it's entertainment. <laughs> yeah, it's entertainment. You see, the thing is, eh? Uh, like my mom at one point used to really like in, in 2010, right? I stopped going to election rally. 2015. Mm. Because one night I went by my mother. My mother's almost in tears mm. because of the way people are, and you know. And then I also made an assessment for my personal safety. It's not in my interest to go physically to the, to the rallies. Yeah. And my mother, you know, parents already. You just take on this thing with people, you know. And I said to her once, I said, I don't take them on. Why are you taking them on? You know, people have attacked my wife. They said all kind of things about me and all kind of one. Yeah. But the thing is, as a journalist, I understand that people have a right to talk. And, you know, I, I think sometimes people go over, above, and beyond. But I believe strongly in freedom of expression. I don't believe that you should defame and bully and demean somebody but it, the, the period when that would have affected me that that's portion of my life is gone that's when i was in grammar school in my teens and all yeah that, that segment of my life is gone you know it, it, it really doesn't it, it doesn't I, you know so i read the comments and if somebody said well you know why didn't he quote this and i look for the the, 
the, the points that they're making that can improve it. Because mm -hmm. I personally believe that when someone is critical of you, critical of me, yeah, they help me more than when they praise me. Because when you praise me, you identify my strengths. So my strengths might become stronger and stronger, but my weaknesses might remain. But in addition, when you get criticized, especially on a public forum, like under the comments on Eyewitness, is it, it kind of drives other people to see what it is you really talk about in the article. Well, you know, so con controversy sells. Promo is promo. Yeah. Controversy sells. But going back to hard times in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and you said yourself, you've, you've experienced hard times. To again, everybody to different well, levels. Hard you know Trust about hard times? Me. Well, if you know, look, Bertrand, let me tell you, Jagger. Uh, if some people know the kind of hard time I went through, mm. I mean, I think sometimes I need to 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 publish my story. You know, you I, I, don't, I, don't I, I don't think I don't think I don't think I would ever become a millionaire. You know why? Because the only way I would probably become a millionaire is if I just have a business, just keep churning up money, churning up money. Yeah, it's because of the life that I've lived and the experience that I have had. I am always willing to help because i'm telling you i really know what it's like to not have yeah i know i know i know trust me when i tell you i know so i mean i i understand hard times and i don't want when people come and say when they say things hard and say hard everywhere i don't care i don't live everywhere <laughs> it's here I live. exactly I, it is where i live i don't care if it's hard in barbados me live there exactly but now it brings me to the, to the main question the gap in income between the low-income families the low-income people and uh, those who are making because i heard it the other day and i just couldn't fathom it you know somebody making a salary in st vincent and the grenadines in excess of twenty five thousand thirty thousand dollars a month but then you know in the public service or private sector i i think that would fall under private maybe yeah but um you know you, you can't you just can't fathom it Sometimes well, when some people sell it for whole year, some people work a whole year and don't, we don't like make that. that, you know, and they're making that in a month. You know? But then we have now someone, let's say, working at a fast food restaurant or uh, in one of the, the Syrian stores, they go home with sometimes six, seven hundred dollars a, a month, month and they have to take that as, as that. Well, you see, some, some people, you know, the jobs that they're in is like it's just like you have a pool of money and they're just rolling it. So it's just you're doing something mm. and you know, next month. But there isn't any incremental improvement in your circumstances per se. Yeah. But it's just that, you know, boy, at the end of the month, I have something to look for. I got to pay me passage and I got extra $100. But yeah. the quality, like, for instance, let's, let's look even in the government service. How much does a yes worker make? Um, yeah, I think it's five, five, five hundred, five, so, five, and five hundred. The question and one taxes and the yeah. question that one. Well, I don't think they pay taxes, they pay NIS. The NIS, the, yeah. The question one should ask is the government breaking its own labor laws yeah. with the money <laughs> that they're paying yes workers because um, the minimum wage is forty dollars an hour a, a day, and then you know, it depends on the categories. And I mean, when you when you see the work that they're doing, and even set workers. Mm. It's good for people to get jobs, but At you pay cost? you pay a set worker twelve hundred dollars a month. I mean, to do a lot of bull work. A lot of them doing a lot of bull work. Mm. A lot of them are doing a lot of bull work. Like, like you're, you you're like you're being around and you've seen. And I, I talk to a lot of people. Look, you have nurses who are being paid on the set program mm. twelve hundred dollars a month. Whoa. And work tw 12 hour shifts. $1,200 a month working a 12 hour shift. Do you think there's a lack of, of empathy? Because the, the argument always is that the government can't do better you know, than what they're doing now. Or they, they, they're if trying. The if the government can't do better, uh -huh. fire the government. <laughs> <laughs> there's no money to do this, there's no money to do that. Look, it's, look the government can't do everything, a yeah. government cannot do everything. Yeah. But there are some things that governments, a government must do. I, you know, I don't understand this thing, right? I mean, you hear me talk about my mom a lot because my mother raised me. I have a stepfather yeah. who raised me as if he were my son. That is, you know, pretty much my, my mother. My mother 
reason educated me to a certain place. Then I went, you know, she taught me certain values and, and what have you, a lot of which I still subscribe to. But my mom was only educated at a certain level. So her philosophy only goes this far. I went to university. I've traveled a bit. I got exposed to different things. I could say to my mother, look, you see this thing that you're telling me? I don't agree. Mm. That made no sense. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I laugh. I say, we're kind of old people thing. Oh, we're kind of old people. <laughs> I say, and, then, and, and then I could explain to her, I say, explain to her logically why this doesn't make any sense. Mm. Why is it? that we can do that to our parents we can do it to our brothers our sisters our sp spouses or significant others but the minute the government gives you a scholarship the minute you criticize the government you're ungrateful no. are you ungrateful because you disagree with your parents no you're just trying to teach them something you just have a different view yeah you know and, and the thing is you know sometimes it's as a consequence of the education that people cause you to have why you disagree with them yeah but we we live in a society where people feel well you know some people say kenton chan so ungrateful and all kind of i tell people all the time i got a scholarship under the ulp administration the scholarship was provided by the government of taiwan as a consequence of the diplomatic relationship between saint vincent and the grenadines and taiwan mm. not a cent of that money came from the Vincent and coffers. All that money came from the Taiwan taxpayers. Does that mean that I have to, for the rest of my life, be beholden to Taiwan, even if it's not in my interest? That's true. Because your allegiance lies here, not to Taiwan. And then I think it comes down as well to the fact that a lot of people, like for instance, the scholarship thing, let's say even the government sends you away to be a UE to pay your economic costs, wherever it is, as a grant or a loan. They think, well, oh, the government did me a favor. They don't think of it in the sense of the, the money the government coffers and public funds, you know. When you say the you, government do you a favor, is it the... Like or they, they think of it as the ULP did them a favor. But, but that's the point I was going to make. Like yeah. Cuba. Yeah. A lot of people might not know this because the ULP has been very... The NDP has been very critical of Cuba, you know. But it was the NDP that formalized relationship with Cuba. It was the NDP that started to uh, um, allow Cuban trained doctors to practice. Mm. Does that mean that every person who got a scholarship to study in Cuba under the NDP administration should forever support the NDP? I mean, it's ridiculous. I feel like that is how things is now in St. Vincent. Well, that's the way it is. You <laughs> yeah, know, people, that, that people, is how things is. Pe people um, wanted to, f you know. Political parties are almost being branded like gangs, you know. Like, for instance, when we were making the Unmasked podcast and I made the first flyer and we put it in yellow and someone messaged and said, oh, it's an NDP thing. I didn't even <laughs> think of that. I'm like, oh, how this even reached to this is an NDP podcast. And I have never voted. I've only been living in St. Vincent now since I, since I migrated and came back for maybe four years. Yeah, four years. Four years I've been back here. I've never voted. This would be the first time I vote if I decide to vote. You know, and I'm well, trying to. Well, I tell you, upfront, I'm not gonna vote. You're not gonna vote. But I'm not gonna encourage anybody to not vote. Yeah. The reason why? Why you not? The reason why I'm not gonna vote is simply this: that I just feel that as a journalist, I don't want when I have to write a story in my heart of hearts <laughs> to say, "But you know, I supported you with a vote." You know, you know, you know. I I had that written down okay, here to ask you. <laughs> I had that written. I don't, want to, I don't. I mean, I voted <laughs> before, you know. I voted before, but I don't want to say. Well, you know, boy, when I when I think that, you know, like for instance, there's a candidate making an ass of himself. I don't want to say, boy, but you know, I voted for you. <laughs> so like, I was gonna ask you if, nah, I just, if, if that but would. But the thing is, I would tell you, I plan on election day because I'm a journalist to go through the voting process but not cast a ballot mm -hmm. because i want to experience it for a son mm. to see so when i'm writing i can say this was my experience mm. but i would you know go in the room everything see the, the ballot and everything i bring back and say look give it to the polling car i say i'm not casting a ballot please do not put this mm. you know are you just gonna yeah do just the experience, experience. Yeah, the experience. Just the experience. Yeah. and the thing is you know some of the most senior senior journalists in 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 the caribbean they don't really have a habit of voting you know, especially in these smaller countries, they don't have a habit of voting, you know. I mean, it's everybody's right. And mm. 
I, I, I want to encourage everybody. These, um, this is my reason for not voting. Mm. Okay? This is just my view. You know, voting is a right. And I personally believe that choosing to not vote is also a legitimate democratic expression. But, you know, to the extent that the government that is in, in office affects how people live, I would encourage people, if you're so inclined, to participate okay. in the democratic process and vote. Vote based on your own conscience. Vote based on your conviction. Because like I said to you, what the things that I would consider based on my circumstances is not what somebody else would consider. So I can't tell them, oh, vote for this because this is better. It's better for me. But it might be better for you. <laughs> True. Um, we were talking about employment and unemployment a while ago and something came to mind. Um, nepotism. You think that is a... a, a ne- nepotism is a fact of life. <laughs> and the thing is, eh? It's human nature. Yeah. Mm. If you're in a situation, in a, in a, in a position of influence, and you have your brother or mm. your sister in a jam, you ain't gonna try to help them? Why not? It's your natural <laughs> inclination. <laughs> but, but the thing is, mm. systems, systems should be, should we, we, should, we should think about equity. You know, equity and equality are not the same. We think about equity. And therefore, we have to put systems in place to check that natural inclination to want to help those who are closest to you otherwise we're going to unfair people i mentioned this to a friend yesterday in in 2015 there was a a tape in bagger where saw louis was bad mouthing maxwell charles that's the truth and say maxwell charles this and that because you remember saw louis come out of church and you know leave yeah. the altar and go mm-hmm. in the political rally <laughs> But Saul Louis was criticizing Maxwell Charles. And listen to the criticism. Maxwell is not doing enough for his constituent. This is the example he used. A young lady wanted to get into nursing. She did not have the qualification. Maxwell Charles helped her to get the subjects to reach the qualification level where she would be considered to enter the nursing program. I think that Maxwell Charles did what he should have done. Mm. The rest now was for her to compete against everybody else. But Sir Louis was criticizing Maxwell Charles because Maxwell Charles didn't call the board to let them know <laughs> there's this post that I want to get into. into the, I know Sir Louis doesn't like me a lot, so if he, if he hears, he will like me even more. He was, he was criticizing Maxwell because Maxwell didn't call the board to make sure that this girl got into nursing. The question I would ask, right, the nursing board would be privy to all of the applications, all right? Let's say there's 100 applications and they need to um, choose 25 people. Based on their application of what I would hope would be objective criteria, they would say, these are the 25 people that we are going to accept into this program. But when a politician calls and say, look, I want this person in the nursing program, what does that do to number 25 who was qualified? Exactly. What, if the, what if this person is not who they want to be in, is not as qualified as somebody else? Does that person end up outside simply because a politician wants this person inside? Mm-hmm. What happens to the person who doesn't have a politician as a nanny or um, godfather? to do that these are the things we need to consider this is the these are the ways in which cronyism affects people's life chances because the politician will look at it oh i'm helping this person but the thing is the person you don't know about you might have just totally destroyed their life chances for generations ah (laughs) for generations i think we name in this episode the refuge (laughs) but is is such i mean coming from i think st vincent is very unique in its political landscape oh huh? uh, you're not so unique it's very aggressive on the ground i have this my um interpretation of how barbados works for instance is election time comes around is either your b or your d mm. right 
when election pass let's let's get to work here it's five years of, of campaigning <laughs> and I, I don't i don't get it i don't get why is it that for instance we we feel so inclined to sell a vote for a paved road well a few months before elections well if it was for paved road alone i would have a vote to sell, sell because <laughs> of road, I'd walk and you know <laughs> go home you know you see but no that's not too bash that, that's not to bash either party yeah because i think it would happen no matter who was it but isn't paving of roads a fundamental Th- function that's of my thing you know why is it that only you only remember these things a few months before it's time to cast the vote no, let me show you something right braxa this week sent out a press release ah. saying that you know a certain road was paved and i published the thing the communications officer sends out another one the following day and then the following day. so then i asked him myself so wait is every time Braxa p- publish a road, they get sent out a press release? <laughs> That's my thing. But isn't that what Braxa is supposed to do? Yeah, and it happens for every part, every 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 department, you know. I'm like... Get in the car, start the tour, you know. I'm well, like... We spent $144,000 on this road this, this week. And this number of feet and... The, I'm like... That's not the funny part. Uh, see, you posted a picture where you're giving some, some, um, some goat water. Oh Lord. And you sponsor it. But the thing is, and I, you sponsor I, it. You I, I sponsor it. I must say, I troll, I troll them with a one here because, uh, oh, I mean, we what? have goats at my house. I, I, I mean, originally they were mine. Like I said, I spent six years overseas. My yeah. stepfather is uh-huh. the one who really takes care of them. But in the dry season, we had to go and cut fodder for our goats very often. <laughs> and sometimes six o'clock in there, I don't have a tree. My car full up of grass. Mm. Uh-huh. So I made, a, I made a video of me, um, Thing. Thing. Like, yeah, like, and, uh, and you, you sponsor this. Make sure you vote man, for me. <laughs> man, to be honest with you, I, I mean, Sabota, I like Sabota a lot, but I think I tell you, that was ridiculous. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, was and I good. shared my view on, on that on Facebook, and I got licks. Lick, uh, no. Yo, licks. Yo, I got licks. That's, I had to I remove think, the post. I was like, yo, I don't yeah. need this kind of attention <laughs> in my life. Let me just take it down. Let me just take it down. I, 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 I thought was it was funny. It was, uh, yeah, it was funny. I thought it was funny. It yeah. was funny, but it, it was ridiculously yeah, funny. Yeah, the fact that they, that they would take it that, you know, as a serious, you know, this is this is how we're going forward with this. It was just. Did it end there? Uh-huh. You remember they made, they made another video as well with um, it was comparing the health minister. Oh, with the super, with the some super. with with his running when he oh, was he was I tired. I he was one. tired, and then he put out a video this week. Oh, I didn't see that. With him do a whole body workout. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you need to walk out at home. So it's like yo, and like people are under this post. Oh, I'm like, yo, it's so sad. But the thing is, right? Look politicians could talk about certain things in a way that really influence people positively yeah. without being partisan here's an example i remember once the prime minister was on a certain radio program and i was so pissed off with the host and you know i i was discussing this with my wife recently although this thing happened a long time and the prime minister was talking about his health checkup and by the way the health of public officials at a certain level is business of the people to the extent that it affects their ability to perform their job. So if the Prime Minister is sick and he can't go in his office, it is news. <laughs> Let me just put that in there. For, you know, <clears throat> It is news. I mean, if he's sick and he can't do something else, it might not be news because that doesn't have to do with his work. <laughs> but the Prime Minister was talking about his health checkup. And he was saying you know, his blood pressure is high, um, good, his sh- blood sugar is good, cholesterol level. And he said that he had his prostate examined. He said he had both the P, his PSA or whatever they call it, and the digital exam, the physical exam. And the host is like, oh, so you, um, you went through that, and the host started to make jokes. jokes of the thing. But the irony is, and the Prime Minister said this before, if you're a man, and especially a black man, mm. and you live to a certain age, you would either die off a prostate condition or die with a prostate condition and this guy was essentially making light of the thing and i I think the prime minister was getting annoyed because i'm thinking look this is the leader of this country this is the most powerful person in the country talking about something that a lot of our people are apprehensive about don't want to and he said i subject myself to this for my health reasons for health reasons and the announcer was making light of it I made this to make the point that sometimes politicians can talk about this is something non-partisan he's talking about a health issue 
and encouraging people to do it so yeah there are sometimes that politicians can talk about these things their intention is not to get vote in any way but you know election time they call it silly season yeah so you know yeah, yeah. but i have to i have to go and look for that video <laughs> but okay um recently on radio dr friday made a statement that he does not want to go about this campaign or go about his administration the way that the ulp does and where it feels like they control um excuse me i feel like i need to sneeze but not coming um he doesn't want to have this aggressive control over people he wants to be the good guy coming in to to to, to the elections do you think the good guy wins because they, they say the good guy doesn't always win eh? i should ask a woman that question <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you guys I don't know if you guys have ever read the work of uh, Machiavelli um, The Prince it's a really nice book about politics okay. and I think there's um, a part in there where it says it, it's talking about love and fear and whether it's better to be loved or to fear to be feared and Machiavelli came to the conclusion that it's better to be feared than to be loved and he used some example he said that you know i can't really remember but i read the book and say well if this person had loved this person why did you do something if they had fed them they would never do it mm. so and i said it on facebook before and you know some people uh, i kind of big so i don't know if i could fit in the car so you know i said the ulp a lot of times comes across as very machiavellian mm. and machiavelli also says that if you are to inflict injury I, I, I could be misquoting him but the idea i think i, I preserve if you're to inflict injury on somebody you do it in such a way that the very thought of revenge would scare them mm. and i think in several instances we've seen that with the ulp can, can you can you highlight any if we're coming at you <laughs> we're coming at you and we're coming at you big time yeah. do it with the, whatever they do they do it big with the chest big time yeah mm. I, I could I mean, tie that back to a story that you just covered that you really you feel they did that at masses with the vendors um i really don't know i i think you know i don't want to assume you know Politically motivated. yeah i don't want to assume motive because intentions are not seen they're interpreted mm. and i mean timing could be purely coincidental mm. you know so i don't know it could be that the cooperation is complaining Oh. It could very well be that Massey is complaining. You never know. And I mean, well, I'd spoken on behalf of the vendors because say, people people really need to live. Well, well I did recognize that. Um, how many? Uh, to, to uh, what is the contribution of the vendors to the economy relative to Massey? Yeah. And like I said, I don't know for a fact that Massey is complaining. I went to visit the area and I think that they can, the government could probably put in some structures there in such a way where the vendors can remain. I told them I think their structures are too big because it, it is definitely impeding the flow of traffic. It could be a little smaller, uh, you know, maybe a, a little neater. Look, I went to interview the guys. One of the guys said he's an ex con. He man said, I don't want to go back to prison and do this drugs and all this thing before. And he said, the drugs are another thing. I don't know what the other things are. I interviewed a guy who's 19 years old and he has a six month old child yeah. who's mm. who he's trying to provide for i don't i i, I mean the government would be stupid to i mean you're going to um a uh, 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 a platform for opposition politician you want to cut them breath with you for that i mean is is this guy that effective hmm true right. i tell you this 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 was this was a really nice one we I don't think it's, it's very often that we get the insight of of a public personality as it relates to to political things that is not politically biased, you know. And I think that's that's an important factor of during this election period that needs to come out because it just feels like everything you hear is we're doing this because because it's ULP, we're doing this because it's NDP, rather than we're doing this because it's better for you is better for 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 me there, there's, there's it's impossible it is impossible for any administration 
to fulfill the needs of everyone because as you said they're gonna come in with a plan and this their manifesto might suit me yep better than it's suiting you yep so you know it, it, it's not it's not black and white i mean everybody have to take account of their sel- themselves exactly what you want to you know what you want from a government what i might want from a government not what you want from a government so exactly that's why the government you know look this is election time yeah and the biggest voices you're gonna hear are those who depend most on the government yeah there are people if there's a change in administration today tomorrow they don't have a job mm. because their job is a very partisan position so some people they are protecting their breadfruit trees it is there in their interest to get you to vote a particular way mm. because if you vote this particular way and this party wins then i get this you might not necessarily get anything yeah you might even be voting against your interest so you don't even know yeah people have to people have to make <laughs> decisions for themselves so why well, people say oh kenton supporting this and trying to get people me and, me and trying to get nobody to vote nobody vote for what's best for you i mean look if i want to get people to vote for somebody i would quit journalism yeah i would quote my price and i would declare to you i said look i was a journalist for several years but no i ain't no journalist i'm a political hatchet man mm. and i would be the kind of political hatchet man you would not see you would not hear but you would feel <laughs> when the tomahawk hit you, you would with it. your chest yeah you would feel it ah uh, boy and then that's tripping me and that's tripping us and getting in politics and politicians using me for not me and <laughs> Anyways, I crash. You have another question? I think that's all I had. That's yeah, that's it. Man, Kenton Chance, thank you for coming on to the Unmasked Podcast. It's another hot one. Um, make sure, if you haven't already, if you haven't subscribed to Eyewitness News, be it on Facebook or you, you there, there's YouTube. A, yeah, you know, you, you're really missing out. I think it's... Actually, I have a question before you go. With all the other news sites that are coming up do you do you do you think is it a market that that can get saturated because it is journalism is a kind of thing it's, it's opinion you know it's there should be space there for everybody but can it be saturated well the thing is you know there are a lot of there's a lot of website um websites coming up uh the full stop yeah there's, look i believe in media plurality let like people do their thing yeah i mean where would you rate yourself? Where would you rate yourself now? Well, it would be totally inappropriate <laughs> to me to re- Look, I tell you, I studied journalism, yeah. but I also studied, yeah. uh, studied politics, yeah, I studied yeah. diplomacy. It's like a doctor saying I'm a better <laughs> doctor than him. <laughs> now, look, but what I can tell you as a fact... But do you read other articles? Well, I do, I do okay, from time okay, to okay. time. Um, what I can tell you as a fact is that Eyewitness News is the absolute biggest Facebook page in St. Vincent Grants absolute biggest there is no facebook page in st vincent and that is bigger than eyewitnesses we have like ninety thousand followers mm. and before this um interview started they were just seven away from seventy nine thousand likes wow i could i could say that for sure they were seven away <laughs> i was i was monitoring and i said like, boy i wonder if you can reach it before you re- before uh, we come upstairs but you see <laughs> So, I mean, I, I do have a large audience. I don't slight my audience. I have a lot of respect for my audience. Yeah. Um, I mean, everybody has to know what they're about. You have to know what your motivation is. You started this podcast. You had a philosophy when you started it. Yeah. You might change it over time. But what I would encourage you to, to do is to be true to yourself. Some of those might start one tomorrow. Yeah. Maybe. If you change to become like them, what happened to your own? Well, it will still be here. Unmasked podcast doing whatever it is that we had planned to do. <laughs> so, so I guess it's the same. Right? Anyways, man, thank you so much. And um look out for the next one. Remember to like, subscribe to the Unmasked Podcast, Eyewitness News, Jagger Crash, Kenton Chance World. We would like to thank the management and staff of Echelon Restaurant and Bar for providing us with the venue for this week's episode of the Unmasked Podcast. Echelon is located on the third floor of the CNR Enterprise building. They have meals that will not only satisfy your taste buds, but they will definitely fit your pocket.